welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to this very special edition of Human Conversations. My name is Jessica Lockhart and I am the director of the International Institute of Humanology that's organizing these Human Conversations. Today we have a special edition because given this, the world situation, we thought it would be interesting to call upon the experts around the world to try and give us ideas on how to disseminate, strengthen, maybe foster world peace. Because many people approached us and asked us, so what can I do for peace? Because, I mean, peace is in the hands of the military or politicians or, you know, governments. But what can I do? And we decided to ask the experts. The whole idea today is to share different proposals with you, ideas that you can implement in your day-to-day, -day, and I am completely convinced that some of those ideas will resonate with you and will help you, inspire you, and maybe lead you to doing things. I will be introducing the panelists that we have here today. I would like to introduce them to you first, and then they will have the floor to present their ideas on how we can all contribute to peace. Let me remind you that this program, this show, is being streamed via our YouTube channel and that you are more than welcome to share your comments, ideas, proposals on our YouTube channel as well. You can write them down and you can share them with me. I will make sure that our speakers hear them and can respond to your comments or questions. We're going to start by introducing, as I said, the speakers. The first one is, let me see if I can pronounce all the names properly, Harf Hassan Kuja. Although he studied dentistry in his original Syria, he soon discovered his interests that quickly took him to studying other fields, such as management and leadership or business. Harf has worked as a tutor, mentor, consultant, and trainer for many years in which he collaborated with uncountable universities and academic institutions, NGOs, banks, governmental authorities and institutions. He established and directed the first official training center for the Aleppo Chamber of Commerce and Industry, reporting to the European Commission Business Center. Since then, he also founded his own training center in cooperation with the Human Resources Academy in the UK in Syria before deciding to expand their services to the MENA region. Harf, welcome to Human Conversations. It's a pleasure to have you with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Jessica, for the introduction and for inviting me to be here. I am sure you will have a lot of fantastic ideas to share with us. I am completely convinced. So the second guest that I want to introduce is Mavis Tsai, who holds a PhD in clinical psychology and is a senior research scientist at the University of Washington Center for Science of Social Connection. She's the co-creator of Functional Analytic Psychotherapy, a treatment followed by therapists worldwide that harnesses the power of the therapeutic relationship to transform clients' lives. She is a recipient of Washington State Psychological Association's Distinguished Psychologist Award in recognition of significant contributions to the field of psychology. As founder of the nonprofit organization Awareness, Courage and Love Global Project, she trains volunteers to lead chapters in six continents to create an international network of open-hearted change seekers who strive to meet life's challenges through deepening interpersonal connection and rising to live more true to themselves. Mavis, welcome. So happy to have you here. Honored to be here, Jessica. Thank you. Okay, and the third speaker that I want to introduce is Dr. Paul Hochmeyer, who believes that mental health matters for everyone, everywhere. He is the founding principal of Drazen Moose and author of Fragile Power, Why Having Everything is Never Enough, the leading resource for UHNW individuals, couples and families seeking culturally respectful and clinically effective mental and relational health services. 
In addition, Dr. Paul serves as a senior expert to Ispahani, let's see if I pronounce them right, advisory, a London-based consulting firm, is an ambassador to the Global Wellness Institute, where he advises the world's leading wellness resorts and companies on issues relating to mental and relational health, and is a clinical fellow at the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. Prior to graduating from the Harvard Medical School's Global Leaders in Healthcare program, Dr. Paul explored the use of digital technologies to improve the delivery of behavioral health services to disenfranchised global communities at the Yale School of Management. Paul, welcome. Great to have you here too. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Next, I would like to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Saskia Harkema, who's a sociologist who specialized in business administration and earned a doctorate in innovation processes in companies. As an academician, she combines academic rigor with her practical experience in managing projects and as a researcher, entrepreneur and consultant who develops and manages programs of different levels of complexity. Her main goals are to contribute to intercultural dialogues and she has published quite a series of books and specialized, specializes in peace uh, creation and has created several programs to disseminate a peace building uh, set of communities around the world. Welcome Saskia, great to have you here. Thank you, Jessica, for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to, to be here, and I look forward to this uh, conversation. Thank you, Saskia. And last but not least, we have Sima Lieberman. Sima Lieberman is nicknamed the Inclusionist, and she's the winner of the Global Diversity and Inclusion Leadership Award from the Human Resource Development Council in Mumbai, author of three books on diversity, equity, and inclusion, as a global consultant, speaker, and facilitator, Sima has been helping leaders in organizations create inclusive workplaces for over 30 years. Sima is also the hostess of a podcast called Everyday Conversations on Race for Everyday People, a cross-race conversation on race. She's been featured in numerous publications, podcasts, and media across the globe. Sima, welcome. Great to have you here, too. Well, thank you so much. And as I said earlier, I'm so honored to be invited to be part of this, to part, be part of this meeting and to be with such amazing people, including you, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sima. Thank you. So there was going to be another speaker, but unfortunately, Shoki had to ask us to excuse him because he couldn't make it. He couldn't be here. I will also be participating as another panelist in today's panel. For those of you who don't really know me, I'm a humanologist, which is a new discipline that tries to approach studying human beings as complete integral uh, beings. And I'm the author of several books. I'm a speaker and I have uh, created several methods and tools to help people get to know and understand who they are to then take action. But more about me later on when I make my own presentation. Without further ado, we're going to start the panel. But before we do, I have two little things that I would like to share with our audience today. The first one is a request that I received uh, from one of our viewers who said it would be a good idea if we showed our respect by keeping a minute of silence in memory of all those who lost their lives in the current wars. So I invite all of you to take this minute and think about all the people who lost their lives. Thank you. 
And now, before we actually give the floor to the first speaker, Harf, as I said, there's two things. The second one is one of our followers sent me a short, brief text that I would like to share with all of you, maybe as a little inspiration to start talking about how we can all contribute to peace. She said that in her book, Sacred Pledged, she made use of a hurtful wisdom of Thopten Jimpa, who traveled the world as a translator with the Dalai Lama. He wrote A Fearless Heart. In this book, he translates compassion into everyday life. And by doing so, he teaches about peace in ourselves and in the world around us. Compassion can lead to action. Thupten Jimpa says that when he, we pay attention, we always see opportunities to show our compassion. The question is not whether we, you are compassionate or not, but whether you make the choice to act on your felt compassion by showing it. Whether you do this or not is up to you. But asking the question and making that choice is, according to Tupten, the most spiritual question of human existence. Today, scientists are increasingly beginning to understand the neurobiological basis of compassion and its evolutionary instinctual roots. Tupten says, we've come to believe that our behavior is driven slow, solely by self-interest and competition. But this is not true and a very poisonous story because it evokes fear instead of connection and compassion. In contrast, there is another story that tells us that we're social beings deeply interconnected with an innate instinct for compassion. Understanding this other story, the story in which we are deeply interdependent and that our well-being is intertwined, will change our behavior and the way we choose to express ourselves in the world. So there goes the text that this follower wanted us to share as part of the inspiration for today's human conversation. Now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Harf for his five minutes. Harf, whenever you want to, the floor is yours. Thank you again. For the last two decades, I've been delivering workshops about intercultural communication and also authoring in the field of cult cultural heritage. We all learn lessons from our professions, of course. And for me, as I'm adding value, also I'm getting and gaining value actually from what I've been doing in the last 20 years. The main lessons actually in, the, in, the, in our context today which I will mention, uh, are about understanding the differences between two types of people. Why are they different in terms of understanding and, uh, and behaving? Of course, we had a wide swath of people uh, be understanding, behaving, acting uh, with their emotions, with their thoughts, ideas in, in different ways. But let's have only two examples. They are not completely on the extremes, but they are completely different. Those two people are, let's describe them. One of them, I will start with, with the word you used, compassion. So those people, they, they understand the life and they act on the basis of compassion, sympathy, empathy, understanding, respecting. They are international oriented, and at the same time, they keep their own identity. They are really rooted in their uh, original values. Uh, we don't find any hatred or uh, violence actually with those people. So let's go to the other hand and let's see someone who could, actually there are those people. It's not only about, I'm not imagining. We know that many people are feeling superior or they act in a way with the, with it. real discrimination. It could be hatred. It could be, uh, I'm better, I'm, I'm different. We are the best. We are right. Others are wrong. 
if you don't look like me, if you don't act like me, if you don't think like me, so that has two meanings. You are wrong and you are bad. I'm, I'm simplifying the words, of course. I'm not using academic words. Uh, so what are the reasons behind these differences between these, these two types of people? When we talk about awareness, knowledge, understanding, reading, knowing, those became, unfortunately, somehow of cliche that, that people keep using and using. So the repetition of those vocabularies among, let's say, centuries, maybe, maybe, maybe millenniums, um, made them losing their real value. But actually, there are no other solution. If I don't understand why I should be, let's say, close to the other humans because we share values, we share uh, with the same humane aspects, then, of course, I will justify killing them. I will justify feeling that I'm superior. If, you, if we go back to the well-known book, Orientalism, uh, by, uh, by Edward Said, we can see that many people are not ignorant, but some Orientalist, Orientalists actually, they just wanted to justify for their politicians that let's go to the, to the Orient, to the other part of, of the world, because we have a reason. And we will provide you with, with, a, with a scientific reason that we are able to do this and we have our excuse. So what shall we do as ordinary people if we are not scholars, academics, intellectuals? Simply, we need to raise our awareness about others. If we are really involved in engaged and engaged in knowing, getting to know other people, and if we read from the right sources, not only from the media, because we know that the media are driven by, by, by politics, unfortunately. That's what we need to know. That's what we need to do. Otherwise, we are just uh, getting under the pressure of, of lies. And then we will feel that hatred is around us and the hatred will lead us to, to the violence, which is completely against peace, which we are seeking. So simply it's knowledge and, and, and awareness. I know it's, it's easy to say, but not easy to apply, but actually it is applicable. That's what I wanted to share simply. So five minutes, a few seconds more. Thank you so much, Harf. Knowledge and awareness, the two words that I will keep from what you just said as the key leitmotiv. Mavis, you have five minutes now. Please turn your microphone on. Can you share my slide, Jessica, yes, please? Yes, I can. There we go. Um, there you go. Thank you. So as Jessica was saying, I'm the founder of Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project, which is in six continents in terms of training people to live with awareness, courage, and love, training leaders. And our model is based on scientific research, which I'm not going to go into, but I'm also a research scientist. So we focus on awareness in terms of the self courage and love in terms of the self and also awareness, courage and love in terms of the other. I'm just going to briefly focus on what it means for us as individuals in terms of behaviors in each of these categories. So self-awareness, Parth was really emphasizing the importance of awareness. It means being just really open-hearted in terms of allowing all of your feelings, whether they're positive or negative, with curiosity and tenderness. It's understanding your history, which has shaped your reactions and it's modeling peaceful behavior. When you're aware of the other, you're being curious and tender towards 
whatever feelings they're having and understanding that there's a rich history which has shaped their reactions. Courage within the self is asking yourself, what do you feel called to do to promote peace that takes you out of your comfort zone? Really tuning into your inner wisdom, which I, I heartily believe in the inner wisdom of each person. So tuning into that, what are you feeling called to do? What would the boldest version of yourself say? How would you speak your truth with kindness? And then doing things that promote nonviolence, like supporting peaceful initiatives, sustainable living, economic stability, because those are the things that can lead to violence and unrest, and supporting political leaders who advocate for peace. Courage in terms of the other is just encouraging others to promote nonviolence in these ways and to live with awareness, courage, and love. Love when focusing on the self is cultivating inner peace. So you've all heard of the idea that peace just starts with you. So whatever it is that brings more peace in you, whether it's mindfulness, yoga, prayer, being in nature, tune into that. Engage in self-care which is any activity that soothes, calms, rejuvenates, recharges, or gives you pleasure. It's also letting other people's care and love in. So when you're directing love at other people, you're volunteering and contributing, you're fostering community. So you're welcome to, to write me at admin at aclglobal.org to join my Awareness, Courage, and Love community where we, we just really support and bring out the best in one another. As Harth was saying, it's so important to practice empathy and compassion. And finally, a meditation practice that focuses on either loving kindness or Tong Lin. And I have a couple minutes remaining in my time. So I would love to just lead you briefly through a Tong Lin meditation. Can you stop screen sharing, please? Jessica? A Tonglen meditation is breathing into the suffering of another. So it can be the people who are, there's so much violence and death and suffering and torture. And, um, so either choosing a community, a, an area of the world, or it, you can start with yourself. Just breathing in suffering into your heart and then breathing out light and compassion and love. So it's holding suffering, breathing in suffering, sending out love and light, breathing in the suffering of others or of yourself, sending love, light and compassion. Breathing in suffering, breathing out love and compassion, breathing in the suffering of others, the anguish of the people that are involved in so much violence, and then sending them compassion, light, and love. Let's take one more breath this Tonglen meditation, sending out, bringing in suffering, sending out peace and love and light. Thank you. It's just holding both suffering and light and love. Thank you so much, Mavis. I think that we added a few words to the ones that Harf shared, expanding this view and uh, somehow making the puzzle a little bit clearer. As I am sure we'll do our third speaker tonight, Paul, I will give you the floor now for five minutes. Thank you. Um, and thank you for that, Dr. Mavis. It was beautiful. It's exactly what I needed to manage my emotional reactivity here, sort of feeling a little intimidated by being part of a, such an esteemed group of colleagues from around the world talking about such an important topic. Um, 
And, you know, my approach, I'm a clinician and I work individually with individuals to help them manage their emotional reactivity so they can make better decisions in their lives. And that's really what my tips are focused on. I think that we're living in a world where we, the emotional reactivity of the world has reached a frenetic pace. And in that culture of freneticism and intensity, we're not making good decisions. We're not making good decisions about our individual lives. We're not making good decisions about the relationships. And we're not really thinking clearly about the actions that we're taking and the impact it's having on the planet that we're privileged to live on. And so my focus, my work is helping people reduce their emotional reactivity. And I do that by focusing on the psyche, which is really mind, body, and spirit. Um, and central to that is primarily focusing on the substances and the energy that we allow into our bodies, into our psyche. And specifically, what I think, where I think we are at a moment of time in our in our world is we are we are having a we are having a tortured relationship with social media and i think that very specifically we need to be very mindful of how we utilize social media in our lives and i know a number of my patients i work with a lot of patients in the middle east um generation z's who are have grown up with social media it's very much part of their relational and their world and where we are right now is it's 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 destroying them it's bringing them down and it's causing them to make bad decisions and engaging in this place of emotional reactivity so what i advise what i do for myself um what i advise for all of my patients what i advise for people listening here is be very mindful of how you're using social media and the amount of time that you allow yourself on social media and just like you recognize that eating junk food isn't good for your body and your system, that consuming large quantities of social media is, is very bad. You know, I think from, from a central nervous standpoint, we haven't, our central nervous system has not caught up with the pace, the intensity with which social media has come to take such a dominant point in our lives. And there's an enormous amount of dis disinformation out there. Um, and there's, there's just, plain bad information and very aggressive, hostile information. And I think we've given too much power to social media. And I think that we need to take our power back. I think we need to hold social media companies accountable. And just like, just like we need to start holding other people, like our politicians accountable for their power, we need to be very mindful of responsible, compassionate use of power in our world. Thank you so much, Paul. Another interesting addition to the puzzle that we're building tonight here together. I will now ask Saskia to use her five minutes to give us her wisdom. Yes, uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, to understand, to, to be able to uh, determine what we can do as individuals to contribute to peace, we also have to understand how war, war works. And um, war is only possible if you dehumanize the other. And I was uh, reading about it and I was really shocked at the way that we do that. For instance, the Israelis and Palestines, they liken another to subhuman apes to dehumanize each other. Uh, genocidiaries in Sudan and Myanmar call their victims dogs and monkeys. The China's Uyghur minority are described as infectious viruses and political leaders uh, in Europe and the USA refer to immigrants as animals, predators, or vermin. Well, if, you if, you, if you try to grasp this, then you understand that um, this 
process of dehumanization is, is vicious, is ugly. And this is how uh, wars are waged and uh, also conflicts that occur between individuals because we also have to be aware that any war starts with a conflict and a conflict goes through a cycle of violence. And the cycle of violence always starts with humiliation. And um, this uh, eventually results in uh, uh, retaliation and aggression. And we feel that somehow it's justifiable to uh, resolve that conflict by using violence. And um, I referred in this this case to uh, to she's she's a very well known um, peace um, campaigns for peace uh, Skilla Alworthy, and she says what we have to do is that we have to break the cycle of violence uh, because violence is something that occurs in all levels of society. That's the problem also. Somehow it's ingrained in the fabric of our societies. Because also in families, there is a lot of violence. At schools, there is violence. Between communities, there's violence. So somehow ingrained in our way of doing and thinking, we have accepted violence as a means to solve things. And in its worst case, of course, it escalates into a war. And in addition to that, we have to understand also that because this works like this, and I'm I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, but um, I think political leaders know very well how to manipulate us and to manipulate us into follow them into this idea that also it's somehow heroic to wage a war and to win a war. <laughs> And uh, I think we have to demystify this. It's nothing, there's nothing heroic about war. There's nothing good about war. Wars have not brought us anything uh, good. And what has happened is two things that first of all, we have created an industry of war. And uh, just to give you the numbers, it's worth $12 uh, trillion dollars, uh, a year on average. Uh, so that's one. And also we have created a lot of organizations and institutions that somehow benefit from war. <laughs> and this is very cynical if you think about it. So what we have to do is we have to flip the coin. And the answer lies amongst us. We, the people. We can make the change. We can make the difference. We can flip that coin. And how? is uh, I am a big uh, advocate of let's all become peace builders. And how can we do that? And this has to do with this cycle of violence. How can we break the cycle of violence? It all starts, of course, with education. But it has to do, according to us, we have developed uh, uh, a program. It revolves around values, our values and our beliefs. And four important values are really important in this respect. It is trust, respect, integrity, and empathy. And you can imagine already how difficult this is because we have learned that if you have someone you totally disagree with or you, you have has humiliated you, you see that as he's the, he's the how do you say that? Um, he's your enemy. So the, the challenge is, is when we are confronted with an enemy, to build trust, to show empathy, to act with integrity, and somehow find it in ourselves also to respect the other. This is very difficult, but this is the challenge that, and I'm, I'm convinced that we can. Because then what happens is we, if we all start practicing this in our day-to-day -day life, I think we will uh, slowly, this is the, I believe in that very strongly, the butterfly effect. This starts to spread and this starts to become a movement. And leaders are very afraid of movements. <laughs> they don't want us to unite. They want us to be divided. They want to fragment us. 
because they can only function by the mere fact that you have followers that follow them and their stories. War is a narrative. So my message is let's change the narrative. And let's not only change the narrative, but let's all, each one of us, become peace builders. This is what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Saskia. We're adding still more information and more ideas to what we started building tonight. Sima, what would you like to add? The five minutes I, are yours. I, I, well, I want to start by saying I am overwhelmed by everything that I've heard so far. And there's so much, and I agree with everything that I've heard. And plus, I've learned so much, and I hope that everybody listening to this has also. Growing up in the United States, I live, this is a very violent society. The United States is very a very violent society. And in many ways, there's so much violence in the world. And to me, it's a disease. I've been working for, since I was, since I, I was really young, so over 40, 50 years in bringing people together across differences. When I did it as part of my life and what was important to me, and then as a professional in my professional life where I do it in organizations. But I've also been involved for years in Palestinian Jewish dialogue groups. And in our groups, one saying that we said is that an enemy is someone whose story you've not yet heard. And I think that what we have going on right now is we have people who've not heard each other's stories, who don't, who can't think beyond themselves and their own story. And until people are able to do that or willing to do that, we're going to have war. But I have seen, I have seen some amazing changes I have seen people, I've sat in rooms with Palestinian and Israeli fighters who have come to peace together, who have worked together for peace. So I have seen some changes and I think probably all of us have. And at the same time, it starts with each of us. It starts with each of us. And people have said this before, we have to know, you have to know who you are. You have to know what makes you do what you do. What's your identity? What's your culture? Why? Why do you think something is right? And be willing to look at the fact that just because I do it a certain way doesn't mean that that's the only right way. It doesn't mean that everybody else is wrong. And it doesn't mean that the way that I convince people is through killing them. I have never seen anybody convinced to change by being killed or by killing another person. I think that in, in the United States, people say, oh, how do you have world peace? And people say things like, oh, just be kind. And my question is, who are you being kind to? Are you only being kind to people who look like you? Are you only being kind to people who agree with you? And I think that our challenge, if we really want to have world peace for everybody, is to get out of ourselves, is to know who we are, be willing to get out of ourselves and go and talk to people who are different, because that's how we build empathy. We don't build empathy just by... By saying, oh, build empathy. I hear that a lot here in the U.S. Oh, just practice empathy. But it's practice empathy for people who are like you. We build empathy by getting to know people and being willing to hear their story as though it was our story. Being willing to put ourselves in other people's head, in other people's experience, and not just say, oh, I, I wouldn't think that. You wouldn't think that because you're you. But if you were this other person and you had had those experiences, Perhaps that is how you would be thinking. And I think that we have to, it's, it's, it's knowing who we are, being willing to talk with people, getting to know people, because people make wars and people can stop wars. And of course, we look at the fact that it's governments who are making these war, wars. But on a small level, if I talk with you and you talk with somebody else and it keeps on growing and growing and growing, that's how movements start. That's how, that's how change happens with individuals. And if you're in a country where you're able to protest against the government, where you're able to tell the government that you think what they're doing is wrong, it's imperative 
that you speak out, whether it's writing a letter, whether it's signing a petition, whether it's talking to other people. But I think it's, I mean, I with everything that I, I've heard, and for me, the most important thing to add is that it's person to person. Get to know somebody who's different than you. When is the last time you talk with somebody, really talk to somebody who was different than you, you found out what your experiences were, and you were willing to share your experiences. And when was the last time you were willing to say, maybe I'm wrong? I see so much violence right now. And I see here in the United States and probably around the world, looking at what's going on in the Middle East, because somebody is from one particular background, all of a sudden they're the enemy. If you don't know that person, why are you making them the enemy? They may agree with you, but all those assumptions and stereotypes and living off of those stereotypes, that is not how we have world peace. World peace is not just based on my, my peace. It's not based on everybody agreeing with me. We have to be willing to understand that there are many ways of being right. And we together have to speak out against hate. We have to speak out against those stereotypes and assumptions and the violence that people commit on other people just because they're different. And it's happening, it's happening here in the United States related to what's going on in the Middle East. And we have to be able to get to know people. You meet somebody, you talk to somebody. Seek out people who are different than you. Don't just stay comfortable. Be willing to be uncomfortable because you know what? War is uncomfortable. Having people in your family kill through war is uncomfortable, but comfort is getting to, is, is going past your uncomfortability to build a relationship with somebody who is different. And that's how you become comfortable. And that's how you become part of something greater than yourself, which is this world and the peace in this world. I don't know if I've done my five or over five, but uh, <laughs> thank you. But, but thank you. I can't add to anything else of brilliance that I've heard today so far. Thank you, Sima. Thank you so much. Speak out, as you said. And I think that's what we're somehow doing here. I'm going to take my five minutes too. And I want to say that I agree with what was said before. I think that everybody has given us nuggets that are really valuable. And part of what I'm going to say builds on what has already said, what has already been said. So the first thing that I want to say is see the human being first. We as human beings get to know others through our five senses. We look at the person, we listen to the person, we even smell the person, right? And we immediately create an image of that person in our minds. Well, we usually judge the person based on the information we're getting from that person, their race, their size, their clothes that gives us information but those are labels because they're external they're not the real human being inside are they so i always tell my clients please make the tiny effort to look into the person's eyes and consider that behind all those things that you're perceiving right now there is a human being in all my years working with human beings i haven't met one single person one who didn't want to be happy. Everybody wants to be happy. No matter what happiness means to each of us. But we always want to share our own version of happiness. And we don't give people permission to be happy whichever way they want to be. And this applies to everything we're talking about today. We're talking about wars. But let me tell you that war is everywhere. We don't need to go to uh, Ukraine. We don't need to go to um, Israel. We don't need to go anywhere. War is right here. War is at home as well. And war doesn't have a specific size to be called war, does it? So in order to start fighting war in a peaceful way, <clears throat> I would suggest that we start speaking and acting peace. As Saskia said, we need to start becoming peace builders. And to do that, we have to use our language in a pacifying way. We have to use actions 
that pacify. We have to become buffers. Whenever there is a violent situation, and not in Syria, sorry, Harf, or in Sudan, but here at home, we who want to fight for peace can do it in a buffering way by placing ourselves in a way that interrupts the violence. I just heard somebody said, say that we have to stop war with kindness and that we have to stop war through empathy. And that's precisely what I think we should all be doing. Whenever we hear somebody insulting somebody else, whenever we see somebody uh, assaulting somebody else, we're usually doing nothing. And this is common to, I think, all of our cultures. We see acts of violence and we look the other way. I defend that we all become buffers and uh, violence stoppers. And we don't need to do it in a violent way, you know, because people say, well, if there's a violent act and I interfere, I might be insulted or assaulted myself. There are many creative ways to do that. In the Spanish version of this panel, I told the story the other day that I want to quickly share with you. It was the story of a lady who got onto a bus and uh, she was immediately uh, bothered by a group of men who started calling her names and being really nasty to her. And nobody was doing anything. Everyone was on their phones or they were looking somewhere else until a lady from the back of the bus saw what was happening and immediately stood up went to the group of people, the men and the woman, approached the woman and said, Mary, how are you? Hi, I haven't seen you for so long. She sat down next to the lady and started talking with her. The men, shocked by the interruption, just left. They started minding their own businesses. Well, the truth is that that second lady from the back of the bus didn't know the lady who was being bothered by the men, but she was a peaceful buffer she interrupted that situation and i think our task is to teach our future generations to start doing things like that and we can only do that through peaceful language and peaceful actions our task is not just to build peace ourselves but to teach the coming generations to build peace themselves and this brings me to something that I really want to share with you all. We all act as human beings based on what we believe. And our belief system is built through our lives. Most of our beliefs we acquire in childhood. We transfer beliefs from generation to generation. We learn beliefs at home, in our environment, in our smaller communities, and we integrate them into our belief system. Like that, if my community happens to hate gypsies, like happens so often in Spain, I might start hating gypsies, even if I don't know why, just because everybody else hates them. And that becomes part of my belief system, part of my own values and principles. And if I find the gypsy in a certain situation, I might not be physically violent against them, but my attitude, my words, my behavior might be violent because I believe that they are bad. So I think that we need to start changing those negative beliefs. When we think about previous wars, and because I'm in Spain, I will use the civil war in Spain as an example. A lot of people have yet, have yet not forgiven or forgotten what happened in the civil war here. Families clashed once against the others, brother against brother. The whole country was completely torn apart and that still survives today, many, many, many years later. And those scars are the tissues upon which the new belief systems are built. So I think that we can start questioning the beliefs that we're sharing in our communities, really minding our words and our actions so that every word I utter and every action I take are peace conveyors. They commit to trans transferring and disseminating peace. 
And if I have those beliefs by which I judge others in a negative or even violent way, I have to allow myself the permission to question those beliefs. Where did they come from? Do I believe them just because everybody else believes them? Do I believe them because this is what I learned? Or do I believe them because something really happened to me? Remember that beliefs are always our choice. We can choose what to believe. So if you want to become a real, true peace builder, like Saskia said, I would suggest that you start by questioning your beliefs and deciding which ones you want to keep and which ones you want to change. And then act by building peace with every word and every action. So in a nutshell, that's what I wanted to share with you. I would now like to say, before I open the floor to all the speakers, that we have participation from our uh, audience. I have a message for you, Mavis. It says, ACL Global Project has, an special, has a special place in my life. I am witness of the impact in myself and others in my community. Thank you, Mavis, always. That comes from Julia Mendoza Martinez. And George Simmons says, an enemy is a story that you have not heard. Thanks, Sima. It is what we're trying to do in our diversity games, exchanging our stories. And he adds, difference is the key to dehumanizing the other. So now, with these contributions from our audience, I would like to invite everybody to come on this, onto this virtual stage and then question, discuss, and share what the others have inspired on us so we can continue building this list of possible actions that everyone can take onto their own and implement on their day-to-day -day basis. Any comments that you would like to make with reference to what everybody else said? Anyone? You don't, I don't have to give you the floor now, okay? Now it's open, everybody can speak. I'm feeling so inspired by this panel and what everyone shared. Jessica, thank you so much for bringing this together. I'm, I'm very struck by that story of the woman on the bus and, and the way of buffering violence by, because I, I think my, my tendency would be somehow to confront those men. And you gave us an alternative of, no, you can just interrupt it. See, that's yeah. something yeah. that's something that I, I usually teach my clients. And uh, I wanted to share it today, even though we shared it in Spanish too, because I think it's a really powerful story. I work a lot with uh, victims of bullying at schools. Mm. I had to work with many people who suffered from bullying. And if there's something else that I say is that in a bully story, there's always three victims. We have the victim who's being assaulted, insulted or hurt, but we also have the abuser who is nonetheless a victim as well. Why do abusers become abusers? Well, they become abusers oftentimes because they have no choice. That's what they learned at home. That's what they see in their environment. They have no other alternative role model and they just imitate what they see. Imagine, and this is a stereotype, okay? But sometimes stereotypes help. Imagine a kid who's a bully at school and he needs to stand on the victim to feel um, admired by others. Maybe his father shares the stories of how he is stepping on his colleagues at work to be praised by the boss, which is something unfortunately common. Well, that kid might only have that role model as how to behave in society. The third group of victims are bystanders. You know, all the other kids who are there watching or even cheering on, and they're victims of their own beliefs as well, because they, they believe that by doing that, they might be respected by the bully, and they might not be considered victims themselves. So again, we see that there's a whole bunch of victims in that situation. If the kids who are bystanders did what the woman did on the bus, there would be no bullying at schools because the whole situation would be completely broken. 
and their actions would interrupt that flow of violence. And that's when, whenever I work with victims, I always demand to work with the three groups, mm. always, because you cannot continue isolating victims by sending them to another classroom and punishing uh, uh, bullies, because by punishing them, you're acknowledging that they did right. <laughs> They're getting the interest they wanted to get. And you cannot ignore bystanders because that's exactly what they wanted. So we have to take an active part in peace building, as Sashka said, and I think we have to do it in this kind, uh, Paul's words, kind and empathetic way that everybody has been saying. How? Be creative. Confront abusers and violence in a non-abusive, non-violent way and use humor. That's what I wanted to say. Yes, Simon, go ahead. Open the mic. Yeah, I would. one thing I wanted to... to to add is that so much of it starts in how we're taught to solve problems and how we're taught to deal with conflict just between me and you. And I know, I mean, this is not only the United States, obviously, but it's where I have the most, it's where I have probably the most experience is that so often conflict here is dealt with through violence. Whoever's the strongest is the one who wins. Whoever could shut the other person up is the one who wins. And we have a gun culture. And it's not the guns. It's the people and how they decide to solve problems. So when you are have a culture where people really don't talk out problems, they don't have a way to actually deal with conflict. The only thing they know is to deal with conflict through violence, that happens like on a small level, then on a big level, then on a, a town level, on a, on, on a city level, on a country level. And that's what people do because they don't know any alternative. And I think that, you know, I, used to, I, I grew up in a fairly rough part of, of uh, the United States in, in New York, and we solved problems through fighting. And I thought that was the way that you did. I thought that you solved problems through hitting somebody, or saying, or just shutting them down. It wasn't until I was older that I learned that there was another way. And I know that that's possible. So I think we also need to look at how do we solve, how to resolve conflict through talking and have that go viral and have more people see that because it's, remember, it's, it starts on a small level that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, at least to war and killing. And it starts with us and how we manage conflict and how we manage just minor disagreements. Because we have people here who shoot people over a parking space. So <laughs> that didn't just start from nowhere. All of a sudden, one day I'm going to shoot somebody for parking space. Oh, and by the way, I just have to have a gun. But it starts on an individual small level. And I think that, that we need to have conflict resolution also go viral. Yeah. I would like to say um, I've been working with uh, victims of war the last de past decade. So I've met many, many, many people who, who have uh, been victim of war from uh, yeah all these uh, conflict zones. And I think um, what we also need to understand, because I once went, I was uh, telling that to a I once went to... Um, uh, court of justice, where they're going to, they, they, where they were tr going to try five war criminals. I went with, let's say, the one of the persons that was acting as a as a witness, and one of the things that struck me, they look so normal. <laughs> they could have been my neighbor or my dentist or my. <laughs> they look so normal. So what I I think we need to understand that that's a level deeper is what is the mechanism that brings people to do these things because you need people to to you know genocide doesn't happen just like that there are people involved that actually are carrying out these atrocities so what is it that brings them to the to this point 
that they're willing to sacrifice their own humanity for a cause that if you would ask them if they believe in it, they would probably don't wouldn't even be able to answer what the actual cause actually is in most cases. So this is what really puzzles me. So it's yeah. you don't need to go to war for that. Look at all those people who just take guns and shoot everybody they see no, because I'm they're not. so hurt. There's they see no other way out. And they just lose all kinds of control. They don't care what happens to them. They don't give a hoot. And I think you don't need to be at war to find that kind of atrocity or that kind of behavior, unfortunately. Well, I think it's all tied to power. And I think Dr. Suskia spoke very eloquently about the capital that's tied to war. And so we have the malignant use of power that's tied to capitalism. You know, capitalism is a system that works. Like I'm a capitalist, I believe in capitalism. I think that's what happened in our world. What's happened in our world is that capitalism, capital has gotten controlled by fewer and fewer hands. And you have people in the world who are worth two point $261 billion, right? One person is in control of that much capital. And when you have one capital being so concentrated in the world, the predatory nature of capitalism comes out. And it's not, it's about people being taken advantage, people being exploited. And so I think that from a macro standpoint, we really need to take a look at capitalism and where we are with capitalism and the allocation of resources in our world. Um, and the, the divide between the haves and the have-nots, we've been talking about it forever, it's only getting worse. And so I think that we need to make sure that what we're looking at, you know, this talking about and addressing is the malignant use of cap, the malignant use of power that's directly tied to the control of extraordinary amounts of capital and the predatory nature and the destructive nature in that. You know, you have people in America now they're doing these grab, they, you know, these desperate people who will go buy a Gucci store and break the windows and go in and steal everything and run out because somehow they've gotten the message that if they have a Gucci bag, then all of a sudden they have a place of value and power in the world. And the messages that we have internalized in our younger cultures or our generations are internalizing from the celebration of capital is. Um, just it's just it's it's gotten way out of hand and the, the destruction that it's causing and if you look at israel and palestine right it's land grab i mean it's basically all about land grab and putting a segment of the population in, in a contained space so it, it we need to take we really need to take a look at where we are with capitalism and we where we need to look with the allocation of resources in our world uh, but I also think, and you mentioned it, uh, Paul, is the role of social media. Yeah. Because I think is that somehow um, social media, especially when it comes to youngsters, somehow they become uh, alienated from who they really are. Right. They, they create these characters right. in which they can live out everything that they want, would like to be. And then they start to believe that they are that character. But as I say, I'm not a psychologist, but uh, well, if, if I... If yeah. you look at the trajectory, right? And we've been moving generationally from a collective culture into an individualistic culture. Every single generation has moved more and more into an individualistic culture. And social media has really attributed to that where everybody has to, have, has to be unique and be celebrated and the you know, narcissism individualism has risen um so it's definitely there's definitely something to that and everybody wants to be kim kardashian <laughs> yeah, that's like, true. why I, but but the, but yet at the same time um, capitalism rewards the kardashians ex like they're billionaires for what you know for selling things I, so We've gotten, we need different role models. We need different leaders, um, all, all of that. And I'm encouraged. I think that there's, 
I'm hopeful. I think that Generation Z in particular is is starting to have enough. I mean, I think if we look at generationally, uh, people's they're less interested in owning things and more interested in experiences. They're realizing that the planet that they're inheriting is in a lot of trouble, you know? Um, so I'm hopeful. I hope we're all hopeful on this panel. <laughs> I mean, we, we have to, we, we certainly have to be, so. Paul, oh, let me, let me butt in here yeah. to read a comment that we just got from one of our viewers, because I think it just flows in very well with what you just said about role models. He says, we need more women leaders. Right. Women give life while right. men play war games. Right. <laughs> I agree, hundred spot on. <laughs> I see all of my. So men. there you have it. <laughs> like all the cover women on the screen. Yeah, I've been saying that. So what can we, as human beings, do? What else can we do? We have this world that is where it is. And we have this political economical system. What can we do? Jessica, are we wrapping up? Are we wrapping up here? Because I don't oh. know if we have time. I how much time do we have? Because I, I want to hear from we, each person. We have we have uh, twenty more minutes. Okay, I would love to hear from each person on this panel as to what we're each going to do differently as a result of being on this panel, and I would love to hear from our audience as well. Because this is mm -hmm. about individual empowerment and actions. I will let everybody answer you, uh, Mavis, but I think Harvey also wanted to add something. What I would like to add actually is uh, suggesting uh, another tool maybe to apply what we are talking about. Uh, you, When you mentioned the puzzle that our thoughts and ideas are, are a puzzle, uh, uh, to create a whole concept and ideas. Also, every human being is a puzzle. Actually, we are now criticizing labeling others, which is obvious. So like like giving only one label you, uh, based on, on, on race or, or color or nationality or religion or sect or anything. So how to avoid this? Just to imagine that everyone is um, let's say a mixture of, of so many ingredients and, and components and uh, factors and and let's say a lot of create creators inside us and I'm using creators by uh, by purpose. So uh, if we imagine and that what happens to me I live in the Netherlands I'm Brazil in Syria. Uh, if we look at some people around us. They could share with me religion, nationality, race, uh, 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 the city, even uh, even the area and the city. So many of, of, of those uh, components. But we don't share interests. We don't share hobbies. We don't listen to the same music. We don't uh, have the same values. Why all those things I've mentioned now could create uh, the harmony and, the, and, and uh, let's say, uh, a real friendship with other people who don't, don't share the other uh, parts of, of, of being as a human that we didn't choose. So try to look at people as a puzzle that will really help us. This is my advice to the audience. Thank you. I like that idea. I think we are all melting pots with a lot of ingredients if we take that uh, that metaphor and we turn it into a culinary metaphor somehow thank you so anybody wants to take mavis's question on first oh there is another comment from our viewers george says young u.s backpackers are putting canadian maple leaves on their backpacks again in greater numbers just like vietnam but now Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a movement among the young, I think. I love that. Mm -hmm. I can answer my own question first. I'm going okay, to seek go ahead, I, make it. I'm going to seek out someone that I would not have otherwise talked to who's really different from me. 
and really listen to them. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm going to do what Dr. Mavis said too. I think there's a chap at my gym who I go to who wears an ankle monitor. He must be on parole and he kind of scares me. And uh, I've been like observing him for the past week or so and I I think I'm going to walk up to him and get a story and just say, say hey. Like, I don't know what exactly I'm going to say. So maybe, 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 maybe you can coach me a little bit. On <laughs> <laughs> I can say, but I think, I think that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. That's really inspiring, Paul. Thanks. See, Mavis, I think you inspired me to do something. I received an invitation today to host a silent listening circle. Uh, the way I understood it, because I have never heard of that, is like a listening circle is I open a space on my Zoom account and I invite everybody to join the group so they can be listened to if they have anything they want to share. And it's just a listening group, the way I understood it, okay? I think that I might... I was, I was hesitant before, but through what you said, Mavis, I think I'm going to open a, a listening uh, circle, but I'm going to add a little meditation and mindfulness to the, to the listening circle. I think that could help not only me, but those who also joined the circle. So that's what I'm going to do. Thank you, Mavis. That's, that's wonderful, Jessica. I May I add a suggestion? I, I don't know what the rules of listening circles are, but I just came from a retreat that used, uh, often in groups you use talking sticks. This talking stick was a timer, a little sand timer that was a minute and 15 seconds. And whoever was talking would turn over the timer. It, it just seems important that everyone have similar time because I, I could just see it getting out of hand with somebody talking on and on for a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, on the other hand, if it's a listening circle, yeah, I can organize not one, but 15. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, somebody else wanted to speak. Yes, Emma. Hi. Well, there's one part of me that I'm saying, yes, I'm so empathetic. I'm always around people who are different than me. My life is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. I've I've seen some major changes in other people. Um, I've seen some changes myself. However, there's one situation that I am feel very strongly about, and I have been very closed. To somebody, to, to somebody who I know, I actually have blocked them because they disagree with me or I disagree with them because I know I'm right. And, um, and I'm going to unblock them and I'm actually going to just listen to what they have to say and listen for why they're saying what they're saying and why they have so much hate in their heart. Because if I could understand that, then maybe if I can't move them a degree, I can move other, I could move people another, somebody else in a degree. And most issues, I'm really good at talking to people. I'm really good at listening to people. But this one particular issue that's going on right now, I'm not. I'm not, not that, it's not that I'm going to change what I think, but I want to be able to see another part of this person rather than just seeing that that one part. Can I can I suggest something, Sima? Sure. When you do talk to this person, would you be willing to just listen? Well, that's what I want to respond? do. That's no, what, oh, oh, I, I'm definitely not. I'm definitely not going to respond because 
I'm just going to listen. That's just all I want to do because any I, response I becomes an argument. Oh, I haven't. Sorry. I haven't okay. finished. Sorry, I right. haven't finished. I was going to say, you listen, you don't respond, but I want you to discover what it is that the person is feeling. I want you to connect with the person's feelings, not the story, because yeah. that might give you a deeper understanding of their reasons their motives and why they act the way they do. Absolutely. Great advice. Mm -hmm. Great advice. <laughs> I also have an idea just raised now, actually, in my mind. Uh, I've attended a conference which, which uh, took place only this week and ended yesterday, and I have a business course that I will send. So I had a previous plan. Now I will add something on this plan. Of course, the previous one is, is very basic, like nice to meet you, and I hope we'll be in contact. It was a nice conference, so on so on. Now I would add actually to those people who are all scholars, intellectuals, and academic people, also a question, what can we do together to create more peaceful world. So it's in the right time. Thank you, maybe. Thank you all. That's a great idea. Yeah. Arf, that's a great idea. I think I can I can also take that idea on a little bit with a little twist. I think and I can I can ask everyone that I interact with, and I interact with quite a lot of people. So what can we do together to promote peace? Not just professionally, but personally. I can ask kids, I can ask adults, I can ask, I think I can, I can become like a depository of peaceful ideas <laughs> and maybe share them and spread them later, which is what we're doing today, by the way. We have another comment from our audience. Julia says, I think I have to be willing to be uncomfortable and be involved in a violent situation, at least just interrupt in somehow some way such a challenge situation for me well julia if the idea we gave with the woman on the bus helps you or if you want any other ideas if that one doesn't help you feel free to contact us i am sure we can give you tons of ideas on how to do that uh, while feeling safe because it's important that you feel safe while doing that so please reach out to us you can write a message and I can uh, respond privately with whatever information you need. I'm sure everybody on the panel is willing to give you a hand. Wonderful, Julia. And I, I love what you said, Jessica, about staying safe. Yeah, that's we're doing that. Yeah. More comments, questions, proposals, ideas? I think, uh, yeah, also sharing stories of peace. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if, if it's a narrative, then we can create another narrative. We have the narrative of war, but let's create the narrative of peace. And there are countless stories, uh, because stories always, people remember stories. Mm. So if you start spreading stories of peace where people that... Uh, uh, manage to to establish peace and I think that could be very powerful a chain of stories Saskia can you tell one such story because you've heard so many stories of peace oh um, it's a story that um, it actually it's a, it's a beautiful film it happened here in Spain, and it was um, a story about uh, the wife of a politician who had been killed by the terrorist group ETA in the west of, of Spain. And she made it a point, she made it a point to speak to him and to establish a re relationship with him. And her goal was that she wanted to commemorate the death of her husband together with him. And you can imagine the, the resistance that she encountered also from her family, her everyone. They said, are you crazy, mom? But she was completely dead set on doing this. And she did. And what happened was that she, not only did she start to understand 
his mindset, what drove him to do this, but also the other way around. And he really was, um, uh, he regretted his deed because he, 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 he really established a relation with her. And then on this commemoration, he saw that he had not only affected her because of some political cause, but he had collected, he had affected a whole community. It's a fantastic film. Mm -hmm. And it's a fantastic story. And I remember it because, because it was so powerful. What you can achieve if two people decide we are going to do something about this. It's really powerful. Yeah. We have another comment from our followers or the people watching the show. Jur says, people react from identity, not logic. Respect the identity and you can connect. Dictators are good at identifying, no, sorry, at identity building by creating us versus them discourse. So basically, try and connect with the identity, not the logic. This reminds me of a short story that I can also perhaps share with you. A long time ago, while I was in Poland, I was part of a social club. I was very involved. We did a lot of social activities. And at a certain po point in time, I had a big confrontation with the uh, president of the club. I was vice president back, back then because she saw the club as a source of income and jobs for her and her friends. And uh, I saw the club as something social. Well, to defend her position, she created like a coup d'etat and there was a lot of um, uh, fighting, internal fighting in the club. In fact, the social club was almost completely broken down, completely disappeared for a few years. I felt totally betrayed by that person because until then, I thought we were not just partners in the club, but friends, close friends. <clears throat> we were in many activities together and I really thought we had a very strong friendship. And I remember my husband telling me, God, Jessica, you suffer a lot because you trust everybody and you give yourself to everybody mm -hmm. without placing any barriers or any obstacles on their way. I, he said, don't suffer so much because I am an introvert and I don't open myself to others. So they can't reach me. They can't hurt me. Mm. And he said, I would suggest that you become a bit more like me. So you don't suffer so much because people betray you all the time because you're so open and so nice to everyone. And I recall thinking about that for a few days and then going back to my husband and telling him, honey, I've been thinking about it. And you know what? I realized that I don't want to be like you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I said, I'd rather be hurt and betrayed a hundred thousand times, but make four real good friends than be alone without a friend. And this is a little bit the spirit that I think we can also share. She had this woman who betrayed me, had her own interests. I know she needed the jobs that she was trying to find. And my own feelings of betrayal and the pain and being hurt by the actions that happened <sighs> taught me very valuable lessons. One of them was that I chose to not close my own heart to the rest of the world. And this is very much related to what was said before. I think it was Paul who said it too, and also Harf. I think it's important that we realize that it is our choice to react one way or another way. We always have that choice. So what do you want to get? Do you want to protect your heart so that you're never hurt and then you isolate yourself from the rest of the world? Or do you want to open yourself to the rest of the world, learn from them, and then as this uh, follower said, connect with the identity of the people you have there and not just the situation. So I think that's another little step that we can all take. 
We can look into our hearts and decide how we want to relate with the world. If we want to be islands or if we want to be part of the greater community, but in depth and in reality. I think it's also important to remember that there's increments, that there's middle ground between there, right? I think sometimes we get into this thing where we think that we're either completely closed or we're completely open. But I think it's important, particularly people who have trauma backgrounds or have been hurt in the past, that we need to be careful. You know, we need to develop the capacity to to to, to suss out who we want to take a risk on and, and how we want to, you know, so it's not an all or nothing thing, that there are shades of gray in there in terms yeah, of, of course. interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's important that we also realize that we have to decide. That's right. And well, that we... Can. Right. We might need help deciding. Professionals can help you if you have doubts or if you are a victim or if you are not really certain where you want to go. But I would say that we, we need to question who we are at all times and in every step. Right. There's another comment from our followers. Sorry, Jessica. Music is a song. Jessica, I have to leave. I'm sorry. There is an urgent matter. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Saskia. Okay. Thank Love you. I will have to be posted. Bye. Thank you, Saskia. Sorry. Bye. The comment says, music is a strong instrument. The more music culture we have, the more ready to live in peace we are. Let's sing, play, or listen music. Dance every day. I love Bach and Pink Floyd. <laughs> That's what the person said. <laughs> Not Pink Floyd. Yes. Not Pink Floyd. <laughs> Okay. I think that music does bring people together. You know, I have a friend who actually is from Eritrea and we always share music that we listen to and we listen to it together. Like we listen to, we're listening to um, hip hop from the Middle East and also from Nigeria. So we're always like looking for different music from all over the world. And it's a way, it is, it's a way of bringing people together while we listen to the music. And then we also listen to the words. Great. I also it's have a hard. comment on the music, yes. Actually, when I created, uh, uh, when I authored my book last year about uh, lamenting Aleppo city in Elagic poetry. So I, I had uh -huh. 812 poems about the, 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 the war in Aleppo in between 2011 and 2020. What I noticed that the, most of the comments on, on, of the poets, the notes and the remarks they had, and they built their uh, uh, poems upon it are the humane storytelling i'll give you an example i will because the music remind me with this someone is sitting in his destroyed house completely became just a ruins and listening to chopin with the the, the, the vinyl or vinyl depends uh, you know the, the player so only this picture uh, motivated uh, let's say, I don't know, dozens of, 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 of poets around the world from 70 countries to write about that. And also someone who's feeding cats while his family were dead. And the third one who's still planting flowers because that was his profession, but he cannot stop it. So those things actually were much more, uh, let's say, uh, the, the real source of poetry, much more than someone is fighting to protect himself or his country. Thank you, Harp. Well, I think we are running out of time. I think this has been a very powerful panel. A lot of ideas came up. Uh, for those of you who joined us a little later, let me remind you, <clears throat> sorry, that this is the second panel. We had one in Spanish with other experts. And what we're going to do now, what's going to happen now is that we're going to get the ideas that were shared in this panel and we're going to put them together with the ideas that came out in the first panel in Spanish and we're going to create a document with specific practical ideas for everyone to use in building, disseminating and uh, uh, promoting peace. And we will ask our esteemed panelists to reach a consensus on the ideas so that the document can be published and disseminated everywhere for everyone to use, to share, so that we share 
peaceful ideas on how to build world peace on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to thank all the panelists. Thank you so much for devoting your time and your work to building peace in the world and being here with us today. I want to thank the participants for their contributions, their comments, their ideas. And there she goes. Something <laughs> went wrong, yes. We lost, we lost her. Is she coming back? So she's back, yes. Oh. You're muted, Jessica. I'm sorry, I'm coming back. I think my internet just took a break. He was tired. So as I was saying, I <laughs> I will distribute that document. I will send it to all the panelists so they can share it and spread it as well. And I invite everyone who is watching this later on, even if it's not live, to also make comments, write uh, their ideas, so we can build a community, a sense of community and peace and distribute it and disseminate it around the world. I want to thank you again for being here. And I hope that this somehow helps other people continue building peace in the world. I'm Jessica Lockhart. This is the International Institute of Humanology. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here and fighting for peace. <laughs>